I'm Matt Hagan here at the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame on the campus of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville in Knoxville, Tennessee, here with Professor Steve Smith, who is Sociology State Community College at Rowan State Community College. How has your summer been so far? It's been a very good summer. I'm teaching online courses and I'm in the process of finishing up a new sports sociology course that I designed that centers around social issues and how they play out in the field of sports and recreation. Okay, now what is your background in sports and how did you get your doctorate degree? Well, my background in sports is comes from Chicago. I was a Chicago basketball player like your Dwayne Wades and Kevin Garnett, even though I wasn't nearly that good, I suppose. Um, and once I played my high school ball there, I entered Eastern Illinois University and played two years there and then transferred to DePaul University and played two years there with the likes of Quentin Richardson and Stephen Hunter. Uh, and then I played overseas a little while in France came back here and used the funds that I made overseas to put myself through graduate school, which led me to the University of Tennessee, and here I am. Uh, now, knowing how you played in European leagues, what is the difference in the European leagues and the Division I basketball leagues, and what would you recommend to players who think about going straight over there instead of waiting to do, to do the draft when they're not chosen? Well, the rules are different. Um, overseas basketball is a lot faster paced than American basketball because they dribble a lot less and pass more. So you have to be prepared for increased speed and a slight change in rules. They can play off the rim so they can dunk back in things that are rolling around, you know, and, and the fouls are a little bit different situation because in some countries you only get five fouls as, as opposed to six. Um, but the major difference is college is a proving ground where you have room for mistakes and preparations and um, overseas basketball is a business so you're entering right into a situation where you have to produce in a situation where you may not have developed all of your skill. It's a lot less developing over there and it's more I want you to produce because money's behind it so I would suggest that players go to college and try to find a great coach that's going to develop them best at their positions and then they'll have more wiggle room to grow physically and mentally in preparation for an 82 game season if they make it to the pros. With that said, the NBA draft is June 28th and right now the big story is Jared Sullinger who is a two-time All-American for Ohio State is not being invited to the NBA draft. What is your take on this? It's a little selfish take, but in my opinion, I'm glad of it because he'll sneak under the radar and possibly get picked up like maybe in the 20s of positions by maybe my San Antonio Spurs, which I'm a big fan of, and they'll put him in the rotation just like they did Kawhi Leonard and continue the great production. But his numbers speak for itself. I think he's a great player and he seems to have a good attitude, so I'm not sure what they're seeing in the training camps and practices that are pushing it in that direction, but I, I personally think he's going to be a very good player, and he, we will see him in the NBA, and um, a lot of teams might, quite frankly, regret not picking him up or inviting him to that practice showcase. That's really good, considering the San Antonio Spurs made the Final Four in the NBA this year, only losing, two, only losing in six games to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Absolutely. The draft lottery was also during the playoffs. Mm -hmm and the New Orleans Hornets won the lottery. Commissioner David Stern made a statement there saying he wants the eligibility for the NBA draft to be 20 years old minimum and two years removed from high school. Right now, it's one year removed from high school and you have to be 19. What's your take on this? I think David Stern is trying to resituate the situation to a position like it was back in the 90s where new draftees were actually greatly impactful on their teams, which will, by default, give an advantage to smaller markets teams who can then build their teams through the draft as opposed to trying to fish for big-name players who may or may not want to come to a New Orleans or an Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City actually got lucky in this situation. But what it's designed to do is 
give players time to develop more physically and mentally and prepare for an 82-game season, which is a big jump from perhaps a 35, 36-game season in a way where when they come in, instead of having to develop, I know over the past decade we've heard that big word, potential, potential. Well, he's trying to put the potential years at the college ranks and put the performance years right at rookie year. And... Um, I think it'll do that, and plus it might help some of the maturity problems they're having in the league and bring back the good old days when a number one draft pick was somebody who could potentially carry your team near or to the playoffs in their first or second year. Well, with that being said, now we're going back to your schooling with your new so sports sociology course. Sure. What are some of the topics that you're looking at into that? Well, one of the topics that I'm looking at now is – this new push to start training children for professional athletics at younger and younger and younger ages. And one of the side effects we've seen from that is 6th and 7th graders getting ACL tears and injuries that usually adult professional or semi-professional athletes get, which is a problem. Um, and maybe that's going to have some policy impl implications, perhaps at the school department of education level, perhaps at the federal level that says you have to limit practices or limit practice regimes so it can be a little lighter to prevent those kinds of things because especially for the sports of basketball and soccer, we're starting to see very young kids, 10, 11, 12-year-olds, start to have these terrible injuries, permeated disc and things like that that they really shouldn't be having. And it's starting to put the business of sports on the shoulders of people who are probably too young to take on that burden. And that makes a lot of sense, considering, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinions, basketball and soccer are the two most athletic. The players never stop moving, Absolutely. and they're moving su at such a rapid pace during most of the time. Mm -hmm. With also that torn ACLs being talked about, Adrian Peterson tore his ACL at the end of last regular season. He had his surgery on January 1st, and he's been quoted as being able to, or at least in his opinion, he thinks he's going to be able to start week one, and his doctors have actually tried to hold him back on some of his recovery. What is your opinion on that? In my opinion, I think Mr. Adrian Peterson, as well as Mr. Derrick Rose, should take at least a year and a half off to try to recoup and rehabilitate and then work on trying to get back to professional epitome of athlete type of levels uh, once they get fully healed because – you know more than me, ACL injuries are extremely hard to come back from, especially when it comes to performing at the level you once were. Some players have been very lucky at doing it. With, For example, like a Chris Paul, he seems to be exactly where he was before the ACL surgery. Some have not, like your Tracy McGrady. So they really have to weigh out their options and really think long-term instead of short-term about how they can – in the long haul help their teams instead of trying to get back out there too fast and ruining the teams in their own careers. Um, but I, I don't really think that a player should come back from an ACL injury into after a full season so they can get mentally, mentally back prepared too. Look at your Greg Otens and your Brandon Roys. I mean, I don't know. I just think time will tell. But if I was Adrian Peterson, I would take at least a season off to come back 100%. Just look at how much harder they hit in the NFL. And if something happens to that knee a second time, he may never play again. Yeah, speaking of ACL injuries, I had two of them when I, in the last four years. I had to have two surgeries. And it's because I did not take enough time off between. And basketball was the second incident where it tore. But since we're in Knoxville, Tennessee, there's only one other in injury report I want to talk about. Sure. And it involves the new Denver starting quarterback, Peyton Manning. How do you think he's going to do on his first year there, considering also this is his only year where he's under guaranteed money. After this year, he has to pass a physical every year to guarantee what he's going to make in his season. Well, only his body can dictate the physical part. So we'll know if he's able to play very soon. I mean, when he gets that first big hit, the world will know if he's really ready to come back to be Peyton. But hopefully he doesn't get a huge hit if their offensive line is working properly. But I've played basketball, actually, recreationally over there at UT with Peyton Manning, and I can tell you that he's just a natural leader. 
and it's just a trait that some people have and some people don't but they'll want to play for him they'll want to protect him and he'll just by his very presence force everybody to bump their game up a notch and they already did great last season in a way where they'll probably be even more of a force to be reckoned with if everybody can stay healthy so I think it was a good move I mean you hate to trade away good young talent like Tebow but if they're wanting to win now I think it was a good move and he'll probably have them at and possibly deep into the playoffs this season well thank you for that Dr. Smith no problem from Knoxville Tennessee at the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame, I'm Matt Hagan.